Hi and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 81 is an interview with the enigmatic Lazarus Lake. Laz, real name Gary Contrell, is an endurance race designer and director. His unusual, very unusual races include the Barclay Marathons, Bigs Backyard Ultra, the Barclay Fall Classic and the Vol State 500k. In 2018, he walked across the United States, starting in Rhode Island and ending in Oregon. This year, he organized the great virtual race across Tennessee, which started on May the 1st and ended four months later. During that time, which was 123 days, the more than 19,000 participants from all over the world averaged over five miles or eight Ks per day to run virtually from their hometown or country, a total of 635 miles, 1,021 kilometers, and thus crossing virtually the entire state of Tennessee. I personally first met Laz at the 2018 Barclay Fall Classic, then again at the actual Barclay Marathons in 2019. As you will find here, he's a very interesting guy and lots of fun to talk to. Are injuries or persistent niggles ruining your enjoyment of running and hindering your best performance? Get on top of these now so that you can get back to preparing for the upcoming race season. And it is coming. Come in and see the specialists at health and high performance where, utilising the latest in technology and expertise and experience, they can help you get back to your running best. Head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run to book an appointment and ensure you can run strong and free. You can also find them on Instagram, health high performance. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. I really appreciate the people who take the time to go over to um, Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate and review. I do really appreciate it. I read all of the reviews and they sure do inspire me to keep working on this podcast. Thanks so much. If you enjoy this episode, please do go on over and rate and review and subscribe. I'm aiming for 100 reviews by Easter next year. Will you help me achieve my goal? I don't know about you, but I'm already planning the races I want to do in the quickly approaching new year. Can't wait for 2021. Hopefully it's a bit better. If you're looking forward to it too, email me, isabel at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to organise an individualised training plan. Enjoy the interview with Laz and please forgive my atrocious Australian geographic knowledge or lack thereof. Right. I'm ready. Hi, Laz, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Hello. How's it going out there? Down there? Over there? Down under, that's right. You are. Oh, who knows? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're doing okay, I think. And how about you over there? How's it going in the States? Um, we're switching to winter at the same time as you're switching to summer. Yes. Except we don't really have winter in Tennessee anymore. We were... We were talking about every year the fall is later and the spring is earlier, and they're just about to meet in the middle. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it, it's a bit like that here. It was pouring with rain today, so who knows? I don't know what's happening with the weather, but just keep on plugging yeah. away, I guess. All right, for those of you, for those of the people listening who, who clearly haven't been paying much attention to running in the last few years, um, for those people, can you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself and uh, how about your running career and, and what you're up to now with running, like organisation? Uh, you know, I'm actually just an old hillbilly who lives in the woods. <laughs> and, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> we, we, I was a um, very mediocre runner for a long time. I think you were all and right, I put actually. On a, I put on, a few, uh, put on a few races now that I'm too old to really run. I did make note of the fact the other day, though, that I'm starting into my 55th year of running. Uh, those years Hang on a second, you just broke up. 4,300. Hang on a second, you just broke up there. You said you're just coming into your 55th year of running, and what was that after that? I, 18 of those years I did over 3,000 miles. Wow. And yeah. the longest year I had was 4,300. So 
if you just keep surviving, you can, can have cumulative accomplishments. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yep, that's, that's what I'm going to be going for eventually. Now, look, you, you say you organise races now that you're too old to run or, or whatever, but so you've come up with some really unusual ideas for races. Um, and they, they really captivate the imagination of people, such as Big Backyard and Barclay Marathons, obviously. Can you explain um, how you come up with such amazing ideas that seem to captivate people so much? <laughs> I have too much time on my hands, I guess. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I'm out doing my miles, I think about all kinds of things, and you just think of things that would be fun to do. The Barkley Marathon, actually, it was a place that I backpacked back since the early 70s. And uh, especially when I was younger, backpacking was a lot of fun. After 60, uh, the ground lost its magic. But, uh, and we saw these trails on the map that, that we just thought, Oh my God, we have to do them someday, but we just waited for a time that me and Rod Dog could do them because all of the normal people saw those trails on the map. And I don't, I don't know if you use topographical maps much, but when yeah. the contour lines look like shading, <laughs> <laughs> when they all touch, most people consider that not to, to say, oh, come hike this trail. <laughs> Yep. And so we went in the first, the first Barkley Loop, we backpacked it as a, uh, a and all the time that we're out there, we're, we're just thinking this is, this would be some kind of a race. And then you just think, okay, how do we make it into a race? Because uh, it was, the loop was only actually 18 miles and we needed to make some adjustments here and there. And, and what we came up with seems to have resonated with people because yeah. Yeah. unbelievably they want to come and fail. <laughs> I know it's funny, isn't it? Like everyone knows that there's such a high <laughs> failure rate, but everyone wants to do it. <laughs> They all think they're in the one percent, <laughs> and they might be might be the the wrong one percent that they're thinking about. <laughs> uh, well, you know, we've all got to be have some some sort of hope, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so you how just do you, don't know until you try. Well, well, that's it. That's it. And even when you try, you still don't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> And um, then, then you're sure you can do I'm sure. something different that would make it work. Yeah, somehow. Yep. That's right, and that's it. That's why people keep coming back then. Uh, and so, how did you come up with the idea for the the big backyard ultra? That one goes all the way back to high school. I was a, um, I guess, really my only, my probably my. My strength as a runner was that I could take a lot of abuse and uh, I concocted I was now one of the faster guys on the track team in high school and then at the end of really hard races the coach would make the better runners race against me because it, I, if you're beat up enough then, <laughs> then I'm more representative I'm not sure what that indicates but <laughs> And I just, in the process of running that, I thought of this idea of what I was thinking then was a four-mile race. And then decades later, out here on the farm, we were trying to think of how to have a good ultra where we've got, there's just only 140 acres here, and we've got trails on it, but there's only about four miles of trails. And how, you know, you have limited resources because it's just a family and you have limited space and i thought back to that idea and i said you know i could adapt to that and it would work and unlike high school there's a whole bunch of people in this sport that it would appeal to yeah. i had no idea it would catch on like it has there's almost 200 backyard ultras now in 43 countries that i know of yeah 
Oh, uh, and I'm sure there's many every, more. Everybody has, and there's, and yeah, that's just the ones I know about. Yeah. <laughs> so um, recently, Courtney DeWalter won. Um, what do you think it is that makes females good at this sort of racing? It was something that, you know, if I was really thinking, I would have anticipated. Uh, you know, women are as competitive as men, but you have these fact, these just built-in factors with strength and speed and stuff like that. And in the backyard races, those don't, those don't factor in. Those are not major factors. So we looked, we had 21 uh, national championship races on that weekend and yeah. with the satellite races, seven of them were won overall by women. Yeah, wow. And matter of fact, the dominant backyard runner in, in New Zealand is a woman. The dominant runner in Germany is a woman. And uh, I guess this Russian lady <laughs> may be the dominant lady over there. It's really been a pleasant surprise. It is so nice to, to have an, a, an athletic event where you don't need divisions unless yeah. maybe someday when more women take part, we may have to set something aside for the men to win. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> It so, will be interesting to see if, if it gets, if it swings that way, will they call for it? Will they yeah. say, we can't beat the women. We need a men's race. That, that would be very interesting to see. Yeah, that will be. Would the women enjoy that? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I know I would, I would, so yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, Obviously, women haven't done so well at Barclay. What is it that you think makes Barclay so much more difficult for women? Because speed and strength, are, and especially strength, are very much factors there. Mm -hmm. And if you take your normal timed running events, you have a different kind of a curve in ultras because the sample size is small, but you still you will get down towards that. 10, 11, 12 percent difference between men and women mm. uh, that seems to go from the 100 meters all the way to, to any distance once the sample size is big enough. And if you add 10 percent to the finishing times of the few men that have finished Barkley, you have a number bigger than 60 hours. Mm. So it's really going to take an outlier for a woman to finish. I mean, math is just not on their side. No. And no. some people suggest that women are smarter than men, <laughs> so a lot fewer of them try it. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, when it comes down to, to uh, basics like that with the, with the timing, then yeah, that's, that's fair enough. It, uh, yeah, it's, it's not anything about women other than just the, the natural physiological facts of life. It would still, it, it would set the world on its end if a woman finishes. So we mm. really, when qual high quality women runners apply, they have a way better chance of getting in the men because we'd like to see someone at least make a good run at it. Yeah, yeah. Do you think a woman will be able to do a fun run, you know, within the near future? Um, the last one was Beverly Abs. That's right. And, and that was a while ago, wasn't that it? That one is starting. There have only been in the entire length of the race eight, um, eight women finish fun runs by five unique individuals. Uh. So women have not done good with the fun run either. It's no. mathematically more possible. But yes. I don't, I don't know what's stopping them right now. Maybe it's that whole belief thing as well. And, and once more women start doing it, more women will do it. <laughs> Who knows? Well, we'll hope there's, there's really good women to enter this year. Mm. And I'm, I'm hopeful that at least, at least some will get through the second loop and into the third. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, people that get to the third loop do finish. 
cash if and, they're willing to start it. Yes. And, and do you think um, it takes repeated tries to be able to get to that point of doing more loops? You know, repeated tries at the event, attempts, whatever? There have been a few people that have finished on their first try, but most people, it's it takes, the average finisher is in the third attempt. Okay. And then I think the most was either 10 or 11 attempts. Wow. But you'll see most people adjusting for the weather variations because some years are, are more grim than others. That you yeah. see them gradually whittle it down. It's like they they run into this roadblock and they go home, they figure out an answer, they prepare for it, train through it, and get past that, that to find there's another roadblock. <laughs> and yeah. then they go home again. And you either have to have a very low ability to, to learn from experience or a, a real high level of determination depending on how you define it because some people spend years and years and they they get close at their peak and then never quite make it yeah yeah so um there's um obviously some navigation involved but you've been known to say it's not a navigation race why do you say that no, the, the, the navigation is not complex. You have to be a competent navigator. You yeah. don't really need to be able to use a compass, but you do need to be able to use a map. Yeah. Uh, for the most part, you can see the features. If, you, if the map means something to you, the features are dramatic. Yeah. And you, you can see them unless you run off the map. And if you run off the map, then, oh, you're so screwed. Makes it a bit tricky. <laughs> um, it's more a matter that you have to always pay attention. There, there is not that luxury of ever hitting a space where you say, I just got in a groove and I shut my eyes and I win, I win, I win, I win. You can do that. But then you say, and then I saw a sign that said Anderson County. And I thought, that's not the county. The race is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. So, um, so what is it then? If if you're saying it's not so much the navigation, as long as you know how to read a map, what is it that makes the Barclay so incredibly difficult? It's uh, well, it's physically challenging. Obviously, the sheer the sheer volume of climb, and yeah. if you talk to Frozen Ed Furta, he could show you all the math. It actually requires a greater, proportionally greater amount of energy when a slope gets beyond a certain degree of steepness, which most of the slopes out there pass that. Mm. Uh, you use your arms like. But you have to pay attention all the time, yeah. which is harder than it thinks to focus on something for two and a half days. Yeah. And you have to you have to be able to problem solve because even if you're paying attention, you're you'll you'll more quickly notice that something's wrong, but things will still go wrong. Yeah. People have had horrible problems by getting off track in the fifth loop. After they've done it four times, they they miss the same turn that they've done four times in the last two days. Yeah, but it just because you're also dealing with a lot of fatigue, um, you have to deal with a lot of uncertainty, not knowing the exact course until the race. Yeah, uh, not knowing the starting time because when you're planning out your gear. There's a different set of stuff you take for 12 hours where it's going to be all in the dark, all in the day, half in the day, half in the dark, uh, raining, cold, sunny, hot. You, you, so you really have to, you have to start your game plan for the race just hours before it's, that it might start. And then you have, when, then you really have to pull that all together in the last hour between the conch shell and the starting line. Yeah. So there's all my years in athletics, I've learned that the most difficult thing to deal with 
for an athlete is uncertainty. I mean, you see players who can deal, can handle almost anything and totally lose it over an official's call. Why? It's not controllable and it's not certain. Yeah. And uh, so the Barkley is set up to keep the athlete in a state of perpetual uncertainty. And is that why you chose to do that with the, with the start time and, and that sort of thing, just to increase that level of uncertainty? Every, yeah, everything is, everything is designed. The yeah. um, Leaving all your electronics behind didn't used to be a big deal because you didn't have much electronics. That's right. Yeah. But I found it recently that people really feel exposed because they always have their electronics. And I think only because of our longstanding tradition do we get away with not putting trackers on you. I know races that are built in the spirit of the Barkley, the governments, wherever they are, will always require them, put a tracker on the rider. And they say, you can do that. They, they can't use it to tell where they are. No, but you, you have that comfort of knowing you're still attached. And to, to me and to a lot of the people that really embrace the Barkley, it's one of the great things about it. It's one of the few times in your life that you walk past that yellow gate and hit that trailhead and you're not connected to anything. Yeah. You're totally on your own. We don't get to do that much anymore. No, very, very rarely. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, and and having the tracker then obviously um well i suppose they can't look back at the data but i guess yeah they know that if something goes wrong that they're fine whereas uh with the barclay if something goes yeah. wrong you've got to sort it out yourself if something goes wrong you've got to sort it out yourself i yeah. mean we would eventually come look for you <laughs> hopefully probably probably eventually we'll find you if, yeah. if no other way by when the smell got bad. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, you you have to solve your problems yourself. Yeah. And can you explain a bit to people who don't know, like certainly for Australians who don't know much about Tennessee, what the weather is like with within that area, the frozen head state park? Mostly Tennessee's weather is is not that bad or at least predictable you have yeah. up in the mountains where you get the weather you get in the mountains and you have down here in the hills where we are where you get the weather we get frozen head is this there's this square block of mountains about 50 miles on a side that just jut up out of the ground and they as the locals say they stick into the jet stream and so they have their own weather it's 15 miles from the park entrance to Wardburg. We've gone out there and hiked setting out books in a freezing rain all day long and go back to Wardburg and, and it was sunny and warm <laughs> the whole day. Wow. Uh, it has, it has a, they call it a microclimate. It has yeah. its own weather and the weather can change from one side of the mountain to the other. You'll be peeled off all your layers and hiking up the hill and you get to the top and and there's this fear of course the top is like this and there's this fierce wind coming across it and ice all over the tree sticking out that far and it's mm. 30 degrees colder on the other side of the mountain than it is on the side you're on and yeah. all you can do is get back below that the, the lip and have a last cigarette and <laughs> and suck it up and go. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. I know um, last year it, it was hot when we started and, and then, um, yeah, it was snowing that night. So, yeah. The, um, the second loop, I think it was either last, last year or, well, not last year, the last year, the year we held it yeah, the I mean, year before. That they, yeah. they started the second loop and it was 80 degrees of, our temperature which I'm not sure what that is yours yeah. but oh, before they oh. finished that loop they were they were in snow this deep that's right the, yeah <laughs> yeah that was that was top. 
That was 2019. And I'm saying last year, that's the year I mean. Yeah, that's right. It was, that was phenomenal. Yeah. It's not like that many places no. where that you can get a 60 degree temperature change during a loop. Yeah. Or in 20 miles. Yeah, you certainly got to um, be prepared when, with your pack, um, <laughs> with all your gear. So um, I had a, a friend wanting me to ask you this question. What is the one thing Barclay Virgins have in common that still surprises you every year? That they have in common? Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the virgins seem to do every year, even though you think, come on, they'll, you know, they might not do it this year. So the, the virgins seem the to bar, do it. The Barkley virgins always say, come back and say, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I knew in my head that it was bad but I couldn't imagine it was that bad. <laughs> I think what catches people is that you look and you say a hundred miles, a 60 hour time limit. And in your mind, you perceive, okay, I just have to slog it out mm. in a steady effort under, within myself for 60 hours. I just have to stick with it. And then you get there and discover that no, most of the time you're redlining, you're going right <laughs> you're climbing hills where that god help you if you're trying to run with a heart rate monitor <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you're a light technology yes then you might find out but <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know what your heart rate is no. doing on some of those hills no yeah and and even going down them sometimes my heart your heart rate might be pretty high too because of the fear. <laughs> uh, I relied on I would just stick let it go and yeah. stick my arms out and when I feel it getting out of control you just catch on trees. Yes. Yeah. To kind of bleed some of the speed up before you, yeah. you fly off the side. <laughs> but then you find out that the next day your shoulders are so sore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's a whole other challenge. And and why do you <laughs> think? Um, actually, another question. Uh, a friend asked me to ask you why do you think certain countries do well at Barclay, whereas others not so well? You know, the participants from those countries. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, I think sample size could be a lot of it. Yeah. And because uh, like the first Englishman that came was the first person to finish the hundred because he had the advantage that all the Americans knew it was not possible. And yeah. that was always in the back of their head. Yeah. Uh, David Horton, who later on finished himself, had done it like six or seven times when Mark Williams finished. And the first thing he told Mark, he said, well, congratulations. Now you've ruined it for everybody. <laughs> Every year I go home and I feel okay because it's not possible anyway. And now you know it can be done. Yeah. 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 So that's a, that's a good question. I, it's equally interesting to me is why some nationalities are so drawn to it. Yeah. You know, the, the, the French are nuts for the Barclay, but they have had notoriously little success. That's right, yeah. Uh, there's no country that sends in more applications than France. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yet... Um, well, the U.S., obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, international runners we're talking yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so why, why, why then? I mean, I... I it's just, a, it's a, and the French even have their own um, version. Someone started their own version of the Barclay, haven't they, as well? They're doing one yes. as well. Mm. For those people who can't get it's into Barclay, a, it's, a, <laughs> the, it's a Barclay inspired race. That's right. There are, there are two or three or, or so now that have started in different places, and what's each one has to be unique because it's unique to the area that they are the, the, yeah. the the nature of the terrain the nature of the environment the weather conditions 
but yeah. you can still adhere to the same principles of throwing people out there on their own and, and putting yeah. them at the edge of just at the edge which is it's a trick to find people yeah. it, it, it's easy to make a course people can finish it's easy to make a course nobody can finish but to squeeze it down to where just very few have a, a lot of thought goes into how each section is and where it lays and how it fits together yeah. to, to keep people right on that raw edge yeah, because if it was if it was truly impossible, no one would really want to do it. But people know that there is that slim chance, so that's what keeps them coming back <laughs> and pulling them in. Yeah. Oh, so why about one percent of the people get a chance can try. Yeah. Or you know, are, have the qualifications to try, and about one percent of them can finish it. And <laughs> You could well tell everybody, you could answer my question, why do, why is it so important to find out if you're one of the 1% of the 1%? Yeah, I mean. What is that, the draw to train so hard and hurt yourself so bad? And, and that's, that's the eternal question, especially when, when you're out there, because <laughs> it's just, you know, what is it? That's it. it. It's an inner drive. It's just that wanting to. Yeah. So why do you, and, and in saying that, why do you think Barclay has captured the imagination of the running community? You know, um, even not necessarily for people who want to run it, but ev as you well know, everyone wants to come and watch it now. So what do you think it is about it? Uh, I, can, I guess I can understand wanting to watch it. It's, it's yeah. like a slow motion train wreck yeah. uh, and and then when someone finishes it's just because i've been there for all of course yeah it's an, you feel elevated because you witness this person you see them going out on the loop four and loop five and you think in a normal race if you saw someone in that condition you would be arguing whether or not you made them quit. We're sending them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, and but, um, uh, mm. but we're doing everything we can to make that harder for people to do because there's not a place for spectators. No, it's not at all. Yeah. And I think... Um, People also probably want to come out because there is no no cell reception there, and so they're not getting their updates. So they want to come and see what's going on, don't they? There's also not much to see. No, if, uh, there's not. If someone yeah. is in camp and you're not in their way, it's because they've quit. <laughs> exactly. And the, the ones that are still in the race, they need really no one in their way because the time in camp is so precious yeah that you have to as well again as you would well grasp you every minute has to be used to its maximum because you're you're counting it down on how much time you have to finish yeah Vir virtually every finisher matter of, i think that there's only been one who did not when they started the last loop have to run the la the fifth loop faster than they did the fourth in order to finish. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, sixty hours sounds really generous, but um, yeah, it's it's a real it's a real tough. It's actually a very very tough cutoff for the people that have the the experience and knowledge, and they have that math working in their head. And you're figuring out the, your rates of decline and, you yeah. know, rather than thinking, oh, if I do the first one in eight and a half hours, I've already built a, a three and a half hour gap. Yeah. And they're thinking how much of that gap they're going to need if they have to sleep when they slow down in the dark, when they slow down after three loops. And they already know you don't have a minute to spare. A, yeah. a five minute off course is, is, that's five minutes you didn't have and, and you're, you're already reworking the math and saying, I've got to make that up somewhere. 
So, so do you think um, in saying that, do you think it's important for competitors to have some sleep between loops? It has been done with absolutely zero sleep and it has been done where the people run hard enough to squeeze out as much as an hour of sleep at a time. Yeah. Usually just once during the race. But again, you know the trade-off. If to buy that hour of time, you pay a high physical price. Yeah. And yeah. if you if you try to spare your body that price, then your brain has to deal with no sleep and you still have to focus and concentrate and you have to be able to solve problems on yeah. the fly. You know, when you're, when you're not where you think you should be or you're where you think you should be, but you're not sure you're there. Yeah. When you, when you pick up a book, it's the greatest feeling in the world. Cause I, I, it's not as bad for me because I know that countryside so well, yeah. but when, when you, but I know from being there, you pick up that book, you know, you're in exactly the right place <laughs> that you're supposed to be. Yeah. But when you put it back in the bag and stick it back where it was and walk away, now you won't know for absolutely sure you're in the right place again until you hit the next book. Yeah. And if you hit a point that you know you're not in the right place, you have to figure out what to do. The tendency is to want to forge ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, going faster is a poor solution to the problem of your navigation is off. Yeah. That just gets <laughs> you further out of the way. Back. Yeah. That's when they come back and they've been in a different county because that <laughs> really does happen. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I mean, um, and in saying that, with you saying that it's speed and strength, there have been some strong runners or, you know, ultra runners that have come out to, to do your race but have not been able to even complete one loop um, or, or not done much because of their navigation. So there is an element of, of all of it, isn't there, really? You have to have all the skill sets. If That's you... the thing, yeah. If you're missing one, I tell you the, the group athletes who have through hiking experience it really seems to be a, a big help. Now the, the pure through hikers have struggled because of the speed. You have to go too fast. Yeah. But if you're just a pure runner and you need a flag and an arrow and probably a person doing this every time you come to a turn, yeah. you're due. Yeah. And then you have to be able to plan, what do I need to carry for a 12 hour loop? Yeah. Where that it could be ex excruciatingly hot when I start. And, uh, you know, 20 below zero centigrade before I finish. Mm. With precipitation the whole time. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah and, and, high, um, winds. <laughs> and high winds and, and you might get to the jugs of water and they're frozen and so you need to have enough <laughs> you need you need to uh you need to have a lot of skills and you have to have a real high suffer suffer yeah. tolerance yeah you, you've got to be able to be really uncomfortable and not you know, you just think this is a this is a lot of discomfort. <laughs> I don't like it, but I'm not going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if it feels like it, you're not. <laughs> Even though you might hope for it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so speed and strength are, are big components, and that's mainly because of obviously the hills, and then trying to move through those hills fast. Um, and so also you, t you talk about the loops being um, 20 miles each, each loop and yet you seem to sometimes add books and, and yet the distance stays the same. How, how does that work? <laughs> um, we measure it to the hundredth of a mile. I so thought you it did. Is very precise. <laughs> yeah. Precision is important. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, 
no one's ever accused us of having a short course. No. <laughs> and, and that's we're, good. We're proud of that record. <laughs> so some of the measurements that people are going to tell you for the distance are, well, one, there they might be ridiculous, or two, that might be how far that person went yep. in order to cover the actual 20 miles of the course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and seeing as there's no electronics, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the parts that are on normal trails, people are sometimes disappointed to see that the measurements are pretty close to what the, the stated measurements are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, you've had all these really brilliant ideas for races. Do you have any, any more interesting ideas for different races? So we can get I have heads up. More, more things in mind that, that, I, that there will ever be a chance to do, especially now that they've opened up the, the realm of doing virtual events. You know, I just, just passing through Australia. Uh, well, actually, I'm ahead in course work for the race. And but in my place within the race, I won't get to Australia until I cross Antarctica. And and which uh, race is that? Sorry, polar race. Ah, okay. The circumpolar race. You know, you always think run around the world, run around the world. Well, you can't do it because if you go around the equator, which is the obvious place, since anywhere else you're just doing part of the world. Yeah. Uh, it's all water. Yeah. You know, you run across a strip of Africa and some pieces of islands and a, a little bit of South America below the big hump at the top. But if you move the equator and flip it on its side and you have North and South America, Antarctica, Tasmania, Australia, the islands up to, to Southeast Asia, and then through Southeast Asia and up uh, across India and up to uh, the tip of Norway, and then it's just a hop to the top of North America again. We picture the, we don't, we know the world is a globe, but we picture it like it's a tube. Yes, yeah. And don't think about the part that at the top it almost connects. It's just really cold to go across. So we've laid out a route where that you go all the way around the world and it's, it's virtually all on land. Ah, okay. And we're doing a virtual version of that. And, and I'm having a really good time because I'm studying all these countries and learning things about them I didn't know. Yeah. Indonesia, I guess, is close to you. So you probably have some idea. Indonesia was just a blank. And it's the one I'm working on right now in, in, in researching out the route, the history and the geology and all the things about it. And it's, it's like, who would have ever thought <laughs> that there was so much to Indonesia? Yeah. And mm -hmm. Australia was had a lot of surprises. Uh, oh. The Simpson Desert. Yep. We're recommending everyone carry more than one handheld to cross <laughs> the Simpson Desert. Yeah, that might be <laughs> handy. <laughs> yeah. And then there's, what's the, oh, the city, I can't think of the name. It's just north of the Simpson Desert, right in the middle, and it's a place everyone's heard of, but you always picture it as just like a little, like a go look it up and yeah. see. I don't know, it's clearly my uh, Australian geography is terrible. <laughs> yeah, it's north and west of the Simpson Desert, and it's all the main highways crossing the continent, north, south, and east, west, seem like they go through there. Oh, I don't have a clue. And it's, can, can I have one second to go look yep. it up real quick? Yep, yep, have a look. Because it'll be good to know. I we'll have to click on my computer and get it to start. Anyway, I, yeah. uh, when I looked it up on Google Street View, I'd have this picture of this place all my life. It's like a, a little country store in the middle of the desert at a crossroads. 
And no, it's this whole, it's a small city, but it's, it's like basically a modern city with no water. And, oh. uh, yeah. it's, it's so different than the way I pictured it being. There's the yeah. Well, I shall be interested to know because yeah, like I said, I clearly my Australian geography is, uh, needs a bit of work. When I say it, it'll immediately click in your brain. You have oh, to it, it will. It because I've heard it. Yeah, no doubt it will, and I'll be embarrassed, but uh, yeah, because <laughs> I should have known it probably. Well, I don't have a, didn't have a very good description. Now, I don't <laughs> know if the best way is to go is to open up the map. which might be the best way. Yep. I'm still sure that I should have, should know because I know I, I went on a school excursion to the Simpson Desert, so <laughs> I'm sure that I would have been through there. It's, it's out of the desert, but people are exploring the desert. It's like a main staging place. Uh, okay. Oh, shrink, shrink, shrink. I've got my map in Indonesia, and all I've got to get it to do is wake up and shrink so I can slide Australia up on there because I know where on the map it is. Whenever you wanted to, technology never works as fast as, as you're hoping. <laughs> no, it's, it's that way. Well, I have. I'm wondering if, if the people listening, if, if you're sitting there thinking of it in your head, you probably know it. <laughs> I'm probably saying, this is Alice it. Alice Spring. Alice Springs. So it Alice is. Alice okay. Spring. I mean, I know Alice Springs. I just didn't know that's um, where everything came through there. Lots of the roads meet there, and, and it's a staging area for people that are taking trips to all kinds of different parts of the interior, I guess, yeah. including the Simpson Desert, which is, isn't it, to the south and east? Yeah, all yeah. The springs. Well, I probably went on a different, like, not quite that far. But, yeah, I mean, um, I've never even been to Alice Springs, so it's somewhere I need to go as living <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, That's how it is when you live somewhere. People people come to Tennessee and they say, I, you know, we we're going to go to the Grand Old Opry. Yeah, I haven't gotten around to that yet, but it's it's only been sixty years, so you know, maybe <laughs> maybe maybe one day. <laughs> I know maybe one day I'm going to get there. Yeah, it, it's like or that. I mean, I've Graceland. Yeah, I, I've. I've traveled around the world, but I haven't traveled around Australia. So <laughs> similar concept. <laughs> um, and so um, you recently had talking of virtual runs. You recently held the great virtual run across America. Were you surprised by the success of that? And were there any particular lessons that you learned from that to put ahead to more? It was, it was just across Tennessee, but it was. I thought you had one across yeah, America we were, as well. No, we I were th I'm thinking about doing one because I'm going to have fixing to do a real run across America if things can ah. kind of get halfway normal. Yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, yeah. we, but the one across Tennessee, we had almost 20,000 entries. Wow. And it was, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't realize that that morning Derb called and said, we need to put on a virtual race. And I'd been thinking of one in my head and I, yeah. I told him what, what we thought, I thought we could do. And I said, I think we can get 200 entries. And if we get 200 <laughs> entries, we won't lose much money. <laughs> Slight <laughs> underestimation there. <laughs> I was a one percenter. I guessed one percent of the number of people we would get. So I didn't know that at that moment I had signed off my whole summer. Yeah. And so, and so did you learn any lessons from that? Like, was it a steep learning curve getting that all set up and, and running, pardon the pun, well? Um, I learned a lot of things doing that. We ended up 
we shipped more than 40,000 individual pieces of stuff. Wow. And the 20,000 entrants came from 78 different countries. So we had to organize producing the shirts and, and awards and stuff and getting them shipped from us. I mean, it was six different shipping centers, I think, on four continents to get all this stuff out. And made three different places that were doing manufacturing or four. It yeah. was, uh, yeah, there was a lot of education on the fly. Yeah, yeah, a lot <laughs> of logistics. Yeah. What else are you going to do? <laughs> oh, true, there wasn't much else to do, was there? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And in, in all right, well, in, I, I'm pretty sure I get this got this right. In 2018, you did walk across America. Um, I did. Yes. Can you tell us a, a bit about how that all went? Um, that was really hard. It's, <laughs> it's funny it was that a little over 3,300 miles, which doesn't sound like much, but it's really far. Yeah. And I wish I had done it when I was younger because I'm really so slow and old that it, I was only able to do 27 miles a day. Only, yeah. But I'm not sure if I was in my younger years that I would have mentally been in a place to finish it. Yeah. It, uh, it took, I wanted to do it and I wanted to do it as fast as I could. And that was really the best I could make across. I, I lost 20 kilograms on the trip. Wow, that's a lot. And the first 10 was fat and that went in the first month and that was easy. And apparently muscle tissue is a lot higher quality, uh, higher quality fuel because I only burned off another 10 kilos the rest of the trip. Uh, okay. But I looked like a concentration camp victim. I was oh. literally burning my body for fuel. And, and I assume so that's you were still why I eating. Want to do another one. Oh, you want to do it again? That was the problem was that it took me, I basically went 14 hours a day every day. Oh, so you didn't have time to eat. The, the remaining 10 hours between just the sheer fatigue, mate, you know how hard it makes it to eat. And then yeah. you're going through the summer. So there's a lot of heat and other end drinking copious amounts of fluids yeah. and I simply could not eat enough to resupply. Yeah. And yeah, it took a year to recover. I did. Wow. I damaged it. So now I want to do it again and back off that pace and just kind of do it for fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking and just knocking it down to say 23 miles, about 23 miles a day. I think I could do, and those extra few hours every day are gonna will will make a cumulative difference. I mean, 23, 23 miles a day is still pretty solid. <laughs> like that's not dropping it that much, is it? It, it doesn't feel. No, no. When I could do between forty and fifty a day when I was younger on journey runs, although I never went for more than a few weeks. And going for that far is a lot different than just a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And but you when you can run, you you can like do a sixty mile day because that's how far it is to cover this gap. Yeah. And now I'm I'm old, I have some problems with my legs and I can only walk and I can only go so fast. So if I have to cover a bigger gap, the only way to cover it is to go more hours. Yeah. yeah. If you go more hours, you can't sleep. And if you don't get to sleep on, a, on a, something that lasts for several months, that's really damaging. You have to really take care of your equipment at least enough to get it to the finish. Yeah. And then sell it for scrap. <laughs> so so when are you hoping to do this? I don't know. I'd like to start in April. I've okay. got a uh, I've got a route planned out that I'm working on 
I'm working through the details of it because I learned so much from the mistakes I made the first time. Just like the Barkley, everything's the same. You, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you it. do a lot of stuff bad wrong the first try, and yeah. you, you want to do it again just to fix that. Yeah. But it has a magic to it that I would, in the first, within less than a, the week of starting, I'll walk across the Capitol Mall in Washington, D.C., and a little over a third of the way through, I would walk under the the arch in St. Louis. I don't know if you know these U.S. landmarks, but it's a I've big, it, yeah. it's the gateway to the West from the pioneer days. Uh, okay, yep. And then at the very end, before I get to the ocean, cross the Golden Gate Bridge. Nice. So I would go across, under, and over <laughs> three, of the, three of the main huge landmarks in the U.S., all on the same walk. That sounds awesome. Yep. I like that. I like that. I can't wait to, to see that start and for it to happen. And hopefully by April next year, you will be able to, to sort of get that going. And, and, yeah. in that, and in that regard that you were talking about sleep, it made me think like with the Barclay, how do you think people can train for that um, sleep deprivation that they go through? Um, or is it trainable? This, this also applies yeah. to, the, to the backyard races. Yeah. So because the, the sleep factor, now that those races are getting out into 60 and 70 mm. hours, if you want to win the big races, um, there is a skill you can learn that will help, and that's the five-minute nap. Yeah. Because yeah. I see people that they simply can't unwind their head to the point where that you need to be able to sit down, close your eyes, and be asleep like that. Yeah. I've seen successful Barkley runners that take no actual sleep breaks. And, and this is also something I would do in the journey runs or the multi-day runs is you just keep going. You know, you're sleeping, you get worse and worse and worse and worse until you, you know, that stage where you can hardly hold your eyes open. And yeah. what you do is you lay down right then yeah. because you're just going to be gone instantly. Now someone's got to wake you up in five minutes mm. and you won't feel great. But there's something in your brain that needs to go to sleep. Yeah. And you can solve a lot of that issue by going to sleep and sleeping five minutes. It's like your brain apparently likes it, lacks a really good timer for that. It knows you've done, it knows it hasn't been treated right, but it's not sure what's wrong. And you can go a long ways before it, it says, no, that wasn't adequate. You, you're going to have to sleep again. And, yeah. and they'll get through with several times, just literally lay down on the side of the trail yeah. and zonk out. Uh, some of them have said freezing rain is a good thing because you're not going to sleep more than five minutes, whether anyone right. wakes you up or not. Yeah. You will so quickly become miserable <laughs> that you'll wake right up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. So the old the old dirt nap is is a good thing. Yep. So I and I think that, that you can work on that skill. Yeah. I would I would think you could get better at it because I know I don't sleep a whole lot and I do I do not have time to waste laying around waiting to go to sleep. Yeah. So I have little mental things I do in my head so that. I'll go to sleep, and if I lay down in bed and I'm not asleep in just a couple of minutes, I just get up and go back to work. I might stay up all night and just take take a couple of five minute naps the next day and oh wow until the next night sleep. Because if I'm not sleepy, then why the hell lay there? Yeah. So so you're you're pretty just good get up at and do stuff. Yeah, you're you're good at sleep it, deprivation. It, it, I wish I could have run the, uh, I wish the backyard had been a thing when I was able to run because I think I would have done quite well at it. I tolerated it. 
yeah. even though I'm not fast. And my ability to do it without sleep naturally is, is pretty high. I, I've kind of been going along, there's probably about a night a week that I don't sleep at all. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and I think both of those races benefit from that, that ability to not need too much sleep. Mm. Sleep is a weakness, which is easy to say if you don't require a lot of sleep. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I think that we should all look at our natural abilities as being a sign of personal virtue and merit. Don't you? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I like that outlook. <laughs> Excuse it in our own in our own positivity. That's fair enough. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for spending some time. And, and once again, it's quite late for you. We were just saying that earlier. We've we've started. It's probably what about ten o'clock at night now for you, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. It's almost exactly uh, twenty two hundred. Because when you use the whole day, the, the double twelves is so confusing. <laughs> it uh, is. I, all 24 of the hours are good for me. But like I say, I, I usually go to bed at 2 or 3, and then the dogs wake me up between 6.30 and 7. Wow, so you don't get much sleep at all. That's, that's not I, a lot of I sleep. I take naps. You do? I take naps if I feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. No, I, I get, I try to get about seven hours sleep and I sometimes don't feel that's enough. <laughs> uh, you should, people should sleep the amount they want. And yeah. I've had people criticize me because that I've never slept a lot, but I think I go to bed when I'm tired yeah. and I get up when I'm through sleeping yeah. uh, for the most part. And if I feel like a nap, I take it. I yeah. don't see anything I would gain if I spent the other five hours I'm supposed to sleep just yeah. laying there in bed. Yeah, yeah. I uh, had to do that when I was a kid. <laughs> so you've been like this all your life? It, it's always been this way. Yeah. Uh, You're so lucky kid, you, get, would, you, get, you get more hours in a day. This. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I wish I was like y'all are missing y'all are missing the yeah. opportunity to do a lot of stuff by sleeping all that time. That's but right. the Let's... other thing is it becomes is part of your life is you everyone goes to bed. They just kind of pssst, they fizzle out, they go to bed, they go to sleep. So you have to be quiet for all these hours until you're ready to go to sleep yourself. Yeah, and you go to true. bed and you get up and you look they're still asleep and you have to do it again. You have to be quiet until they finally rouse and you think, what are they doing? Wasting all this time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> I can imagine that would be hard being quiet. I know I often wake my daughter up in the mornings because she thinks I, she says I stomp around like an elephant, but you know, I reckon I'm quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well thank you so much for spending some time talking with me about all your amazing races and we can't wait to hear a bit more about these the virtual races you've got planned and and we'll uh watch out for you walking your, your next walk so yeah thanks so much well i appreciate you having me on it's, and it's good to talk to you um you you Sandra appreciates you even more because she doesn't want to hear all this stuff. <laughs> so you get someone to talk to about it then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I know what it's like. Well, my, that's the same. My daughter doesn't want to hear me talking about running either. So, you know. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much. And um, hopefully <laughs> I will see you next year with if the, uh, every, fingers crossed, everything starts to become a bit more normal. On that, on that strange day that no one will expect. That's right, exactly. <laughs> All righty, well, thanks, Laz. Oh, and you'll, you'll have to turn me off at 
to, to end it because I have no idea how this works. That's all right. I'm going to hit stop and we'll keep chatting afterwards, all right? So I'll just stop this now. So thanks okay. again and see you later.